Hey, thanks so much for joining us on our channel today. We wanna to encourage you to subscribe and like today's video. Also, today's word is brought to you by our Truth Partners. These are people who want to financially invest to help us get this message of truth to around the nation and around the world. You can become a Truth Partner today by simply going to creativechurch.com slash give. Again, thank you for partnering with us on this message of truth, and thank you for liking and subscribing to today's video. God bless you. I pray this sermon blesses your life. And if you have your Bibles, would you stand on your feet with me? Um, and I want you to go with me to the book of Genesis. If you can't find Genesis, come to the altar. We're going to pray for you. Come on, stand up. You can obey. Stand up. We're going to pray. Um, and the reason why we stand, I always want to tell people this. And if, if you grew up Catholic, you ought to be thankful because you've only been up one time since you got here. Okay. Catholic church, you up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Okay. But... Um, uh, we stand for the reading of the word. One, we need more honor in our society. And we, we, we stand for the reading of the word because it's biblical. It's not a black thing, a white thing, a Hispanic thing. It's actually a biblical thing. They stood when the word of God was read. But I want you to go to me, the book of Genesis, chapter 22. And I'm going to begin reading a few verses to you. Now, I'm going to stay in this text. Okay, we're going to stay in this text today. Um, but the book of Genesis, chapter 22. And let's start reading at verse 1. He says, And sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, Here am I. Everybody say, Here am I. Here am I. The question I would ask you this morning is when God calls you, is your response, Here am I? Because a lot of us, it's like any, any parents in here, when you call your kids and, you, and, and they know you're going to ask them to do something they don't want to do, they play crazy. They act like they can't hear you. Come on, parents, and leave me out there by myself. They act like they can't hear you or they got selective hearing. But when God called Abraham, his response was, here am I. Here am I. Take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, in case you're confused. Isaac your miracle child, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, not the next year, not the next week, but the next morning, Abraham got up early, saddled his donkey, and took with his two servants, along with his son Isaac, then he chopped wood for the fire as a burnt offering, set it on the place that God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little further. Everybody say a little further. We're going to go a little beyond. We're going to go a little further. And we will worship there. Everybody say worship. We will worship there and then we will come right back. So Lilian is here. Doesn't she look beautiful? Her little dress. Okay, she's going to pray for daddy. Pray for daddy. Say, Jesus, Jesus. Bless, daddy. bless daddy. Help him preach really good. Help the people be open to receive your love. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. I miss you already. Give the Lord a big praise. You can be seated. Let's go to work. One of the things I love about this text today is in this text, Abraham tells, Abraham tells the servants, the lad and I are going further. We're going beyond to worship. We're going beyond. Everybody say beyond. beyond. We're going further. Everybody say further. We're going beyond, and we're going further to worship. Wherever this place of beyond was, wherever this place of further was, when they got there, there was no drum set. There was no keyboard player. There was no guitarist. 
as wonderful as our worship is, how many of you love our worship team? I think they're fantastic. I think they're wonderful. As, as beautiful as, as our worship is, when Abraham and Isaac got to further, when they got to beyond, there was no band. Because worship in and of itself is not about how much noise you make. Because worship at its purest form is not singing, but it is sacrifice. Everybody say sacrifice. Come on, you can say it. Some of you act like it's the S word. <laughs> sacrifice. Everybody say it with me. Sacrifice. Worship is sacrifice. Worship is not singing. Worship is sacrifice. Many of you may not know this, but this is the very first mention or reference to worship in the entire Bible. That the very first mention to worship has nothing to do with singing. That the very first mention of worship has nothing to do with music. But it has everything to do with sacrifice. Isn't it funny how we put so much focus on music when we think of worship rather than sacrifice. That God cares more about your sacrifice than he does your song. Oh my God. That our obedience is what God is after. That's why David says, I will bring nothing to God unless it costs me something. That in Bible days, that if you were to tell your spouse, I am going to the temple to worship, it meant you were going to the temple to make a sacrifice. That you were not going to the temple to sing. That praise is wonderful. That, that, that God does inhabit the praises of his people. How many of you love praise? Three people, come on, don't suck. Y'all gonna suck today? Is that what we're gonna do? You're just going to sit there. How many of you love praise? Okay, there we go. We love praise. And I know some of y'all grew up Catholic, some of you grew up Methodist, and some of you grew up Lutheran, and it was irreverent to speak or talk or say anything in the service. And you whispered, and you opened candy very slowly. That's the rattle. This is not that. This is creative church. This is not bedside Baptist with sister sheets and Pastor Pillow in the Holy Comforter. This is Creative Church. Somebody say amen about it. Actually, let's just go ahead and give God a big praise all over the house. Praise the Lord. So, so if you were to tell your spouse you were going to the temple to worship, you would be going to the temple to make a sacrifice. That praise is powerful that God does inhabit the praises of his people. That praise is so beautiful that God says, when the trees wave, they praise me. When the fish swim in the sea, they praise me. When, when the wind blows, it praises me. In fact, God says, if you don't praise me, the rocks will cry out and praise me. But worship is something very different. And worship is something very unique. It's not what most people think. Most people think praise and worship praises the fast songs and worship is the slow songs. <laughs> but praise and worship is, is, is much different. Worship is very special. And worship is very unique because worship requires sacrifice. That's why David said, I will, I will bring God nothing unless it costs me something. That's why Jesus took such an issue in the temple, and he came over and started knocking over tables, and he made a whip and started hitting people with it in the church. I would never do that to you. <laughs> he, he didn't bring a whip. He made a whip. Like, he's in the corner. What are you doing, Jesus? You're going to find out what I'm doing <laughs> in about 10 minutes. He made a whip. 
And he, and he got so upset and he says, and he started kicking over tables and started getting upset with everybody because he said, you, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the reason you had made it a den of thieves is because they were selling sacrifices. Instead of you going and bringing a sacrifice and going through all the frustration that it took you to bring it, they were saying, well, instead of going through that, just buy a little sacrifice when you come in the lobby. We'll just sell you a little sacrifice. And, and so they were buying these little sacrifices that cost them nothing. And Jesus got upset about it because he said, how are you going to bring God something that costs you nothing? How can you come to the temple and sacrifice nothing? How can you come to the temple to receive and not give? Oh, my God. I'm coming for you this morning, baby. Just sit there. How, how can you come to the temple and have no sacrifice to give anything, to serve, never serve, never give, and, and say you worshiped? How can you worship without sacrifice? What did you sacrifice today? What did you sacrifice? Or, oh, Oh, you sang. <laughs> and some of y'all came late for that. I ain't saying nothing. I'm like... <laughs> but but, but, but how, how can you say you worshiped when it costs you nothing? And this is why worship is so important. See, praise, praise allows God into your presence. But worship is what lets you into his presence. And if you praise but you never worship, if you sing but you never sacrifice, you come to church and you get nothing out of it. And that's why you pick churches based on the singing because all you do is praise. Hey, I just want to take a moment and let you know that today's sermon is brought to you by our truth partners. If you're interested in being a truth partner, simply go to creativechurch.com slash give and select truth partners today. Again, please subscribe and like today's video. It's blessing you. It's blessing your family. And hey, let's get back to the word. See, if you come to church and, you, and you, you're still talking about, well, I hope they sing my song so I can really get in the prayer. You, you, you are not worshiping. If, if you come in, I hope pastor preached today because the pastor didn't preach today. I don't know if I'm going. You, you ain't worshiping. You ain't, because, because you think worship is about you. I'm ready for you this morning, baby. If you, you think worship is about you. Worship is not about you. Worship is about him. And when you, when you sacrifice, see, if you come today and you sing and you don't sacrifice, you, you allow him into your presence, you're here. But, but you can't make him let you into his presence. What, what allows you into his presence is a sacrifice. That's why you had to have a sacrifice in the temple before you got to the holies of holies. You didn't get to the holies of holies without sacrifice. Because in his presence is fullness of, of joy. And at his right hand, there's pleasure forevermore. Healing is in his presence. Peace is in his presence. Joy is in his presence. Wisdom is in his presence. So the thought process you ought to have when you come to, we don't call it a temple, we call it a church. But when you come to the temple, when you came to the house of God, was to ask yourself, what is my sacrifice? Because what I'm after today is his presence. Did anybody today come seeking the presence of God? Because everything you're looking for, you can only find in his presence. In fact, John chapter 4 says that, that the God that created the heavens and the earth, that the God that separated the firmaments from those which were above the waters, from those which were beneath the waters, the God that said, let there be light, and it was good, says that that God is moving throughout the earth, seeking, looking 
for those that will worship him. That the presence of God scans the earth, moves throughout the whole earth, looking for worshipers. Not worship, not songs, but it is looking for people. He is looking for people who are willing to sacrifice. My Lord. Which means there must be a lot of praisers. But very few worshipers. I would pray and my heart would be that when the presence of God comes through Maple Grove, that it would stop because it found worshipers. That the presence of God would not visit this room, but reside in this room because every Sunday there are worshipers that come in this room ready to worship God. Somebody say amen if you believe that. And the thing about worship is worship, worship is not about changing God or that God needs it. When you worship, it changes you. When you sacrifice, it changes you. It does something in your life that nothing else will. It minimizes you and maximizes him. You decrease that he may increase in your life. Every time you sacrifice, you're saying less of me and more of you. And in Genesis 22, verse 6, they'll put it on the screen. It says, so Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders. This is a type and shadow of Christ, that the father would sacrifice his only son. And as Isaac carries the wood, it symbol, symbolizes Jesus carrying the cross. And while he carried, Isaac carried the wood while Abraham carried the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked together, Isaac turned back to his father Abraham and said, Father, Abraham replied, yes, my son. Isaac said, we have the fire, we have the wood. The boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Abraham replied, God will provide the burnt offering, my son. And they both walk together. God will provide. My God, if there's ever a sermon to preach, the God that will provide. How many of you ever had God provide for you? Come on, you had more month left at the end of the money instead of more money left at the end of the month. And God will provide. When Russell and Mindy got ready to write the check and they're like, we don't know where the money's gonna come from, but what they said was God will provide. When we got ready to plant this building and, and start this church and we didn't have all the money, but we said God will provide. See, see, God doesn't give you everything you need at the beginning. God, God is looking for your faith. That's why God... See, I used to think that God wouldn't ask people to do what they couldn't do, but I've learned that God always asks people to do what they can't do. He asks lame people to walk and blind people to see and crippled people to stretch forth their hand. He, he, he looked at, at the, the lame man and said, get up and walk. It seems like he should have healed him, then say, get up. But no, God says, get up. He asked a crippled man to stretch forth his hand. It seemed like God would say, let me heal it and then stretch it forth. No, he says, I'm going to heal it as you stretch it forth. I'm going to give you the strength as you stand. That's why he told, the, he told the lepers, he says, who still had leprosy? He said, go. He says, you're healed. Go show yourself to the priest. Now, they still had leprosy. They're standing there looking at Jesus with leprosy. And Jesus is saying, go show yourself cleansed to the priest. And the Bible says they were healed as they went. That as they walked to the priest, the healing happened as they went. Now, they could have stood there and said, we ain't healed. Why would we go? We, it's a waste of time. We ain't healed. Look, he prayed nothing happened because the healing happened as they went. The Bible says the word did not profit them that heard it because they did not mix it with faith. When the word of God is being preached to you, as I'm preaching to you right now, it will profit you nothing. 
If while I'm preaching to, to you, if you do not take that word and mix it with faith, it will not benefit you. So the word to the leper was you're healed. Now, if they'd have just stood there, they wouldn't have been healed. What they had to do was start walking. And, and what they were doing while they were walking was they were taking the word that Jesus gave them and mixing it with faith. And every step was another stir of faith. And every step was another stir of faith. And as they were walking, they got healed. So when God asks you to do things, what you're going to have to do is take that word and mix it with faith. And God will always ask you to do something that you can't do. Because his strength is made perfect in your weakness. The God that will provide. Verse 8, when God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son Abraham answered, and they both walked together. Verse 9, when they arrived at the place where God told him Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it, then he tied his son down, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up a knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called from heaven, Abraham. Abraham replied, here am I. Verse 12, do not lay a hand on the boy. The angel said, do not hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You not only have withheld from me even your only son, then Abraham looked up. Everybody say looked up. He looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. So Abraham took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham looked up. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying every time you get ready to trust God, every time you get ready to do what God has called you to do, at the moment of your sacrifice, God will always give you a look-up moment. A look-up moment is something when you've been praying for it. You've been believing God for it. You've been... You've been I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about, but some, something you've been praying for, fasting for, believing God for. I'm not talking about just a day. I'm not talking about just a week. I'm talking about you've been seeking God for this, believing God for this. Whether it's a child that, that is lost, whether it's a son or a daughter or a husband or a wife or a business or a plan or a ministry, something you've been believing for. When God asks you to sacrifice for it, I'm telling you before God lets you kill the dream, he will always give you a look up moment and you will look up and see the thing that God promised you. It will be there. God will always give you a look up moment. Is there anybody in here? Is there anybody in here? Maybe it's just me that has had a look up moment where you looked up right when you were getting ready to do and walk in obedience. God gave you a look up moment and you're walking in your dream and you're walking in your destiny. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. And he took the ram and he sacrificed it. He sacrificed it. See, when God is trying to do something through you, it's always because he, he's trying to get something to you. God's never going to ask you for something without having the blessing on reserve. See, God is ambidextrous. I'm a little ambidextrous myself. But, but, but God is amp ambidextrous. Meaning he can do either thing on either hand. Wish I had time to preach on the, the, the two-handed God. But, but all while Abraham is coming up one side, God has a ram coming up the other side. And he doesn't see the ram, but God sees the ram. And, and God is just as much doctor as he is as much lawyer. He's just as much water as he is bread. He's, he's just as much alpha as he is omega. He can do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. That's why when, when Pharaoh, went, I'm sorry, when Moses went before God to say, who shall I say sent me to Pharaoh, God told him, just tell him that I am sent you. Because I can do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it. Just tell him that I am. Everybody say, I am. And he looks up and sees this ram caught in the thicket, and God provided. And the Bible says that Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. Anybody's ever heard that term? This is where it comes from. Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides. We sing that song, Jireh, 
You are enough. Come on, anybody ever heard that? This is where this comes from. It comes from sacrifice. Some of y'all are singing songs. You're singing a song about Jaira, but the provision is, it has everything to do with your sacrifice. It's not about a provision just for you to have more of this and more of that and more and more and more and more and more. It's not about that. It's not about trying to keep up with somebody's Instagram reel and I'm trying to have this and that's the God that provides this for me because I want to keep it. It's not, it's not about that. The God that provides is the God that will provide when you sacrifice. Jehovah Jireh is my provider. And to this day, when we reference Jehovah Jireh as my provider, we're reference, referencing this story of sacrifice. That when you sacrifice for something, you will not let it die easily. And some of us, some of us negotiate with God when God speaks to you about sacrificing. How many of you ever had God speak to you about sacrificing? Three of you. See, you don't pray. If you pray, God will talk to you about sacrificing. Oh, Jesus. That S word again. It's all through the Bible. Sacrifice. God wants you to sacrifice. And when you pray, God will talk to you about what to sacrifice. Isn't it funny how God never asks you for things that you don't want? You know, you got a bunch of stuff in your house right now you don't want. You're hoping somebody will come take you. God, look at this junk. We got to get rid of this. We keep buying more stuff and more stuff and more stuff. The only, only thing I see being built in America is storage facilities. They're all over. Because we need to store more stuff. Come on, say amen about it. Yeah, you know you're paying that $400 a month for that stuff. That storage locker. Too much stuff makes you stuffy. Write that down. Too much stuff makes you. <laughs> Sacrifice. And we negotiate with God. God tells us to give this. You ever been in checkout line? God's like, just pay for the person's groceries behind you. You're like, oh, that'd be amazing. I wonder if I overheard God talking to this person to do that. You're sitting at a restaurant, God's like, pay for that person's dinner over there. You're like, well, let me see what they order first. What is that, lobster? Oh, no, it's not God at all. What we do is we start negotiating with God. I've heard it said like this. Only a fool negotiates with a giver. Why would you negotiate with somebody who's generous? Why, why, why would you negotiate with someone who has given so much more to you than you've ever given to them. Why, why would you start discounting the gift and the level of blessing that God wants to bring into your life? Yes, I'm talking about our vision offering, but I'm talking about so much more. I'm talking about living a life in 23 of generosity. Living a life of worship of sacrifice. Sometimes it's not always monetary. Sometimes it's, I'm gonna sacrifice my time. I'm gonna sacrifice my will for what this person wants to do. I'm gonna sacrifice my desires for their desires. I'm gonna sacrifice my way for their way. I'm gonna get rid of the me and the my and all that kind of stuff and I'm gonna start doing more sacrifice as worship to God. That when I sacrifice for my children, it's worship. When I make a decision to sacrifice and do something for my wife, 
I'm going to do it as doing it unto the Lord. When I serve on a Sunday and I volunteer and I give of my time, I'm doing that as worship unto the Lord. Can we put our hands together and celebrate our serving family, all of those that are serving today, volunteering? It's all worship. There's people right now in the kids' ministry, they're teaching. You know what they're doing? That's worship. That's worship to God. What are we doing that's worship? Why are we negotiating with someone who is generous? And what worship means when you break it down, worship literally means worth-ship. God, this is what you are worth to me. What is God worth to you? What is God worth to you? You ever have somebody give you a gift and you know that person, maybe just where they are financially or whatnot is really tight, and you look at what they gave you and what they gave you based on what you know where they are. And, it may, and the gift may not even have been a real expensive gift, but because you know where they are, you're like, this person loves me. Because of what? Because of, what? Because of the sacrifice. Because I know this person doesn't have a lot. And what they gave me, I'm, 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 I'm speechless. Because of their sacrifice. The same way you can understand that when somebody gives you a gift. How can you not understand that in a sacrifice with giving God a gift? Or giving God's people a gift. When it comes to work, God, this is what you are worth to me. When Jesus took up offerings in the Bible, you guys wouldn't go to Jesus' church. Like Many of you would not go to that church. Like if Jesus ran a church right now, you wouldn't go to it. Because let me tell you how Jesus took up offerings in the Bible. Like in the Bible, he stood down at the front and then everybody brought their offering individually. And he looked at it. I'm just going to have a pledge card. I have one up here somewhere. He looked at it. Do I have a pledge card? Oh, here. Glad y'all are here today. <laughs> so you, cut, you came down, and, he, and he's like, okay, bring it to me. He looks at it, and then he looks at you, and he looks back at it. He's like, okay, next. He looks at yours, okay. Yeah, looks at you, okay. That's what you want to give? Okay. Can you imagine if we did that every Sunday? What made it worse is when Jesus looked at it, when he looked at them, he looked at what they had. So what happens is there's, there's a, a widow, and she comes up, and the Bible says she had half a penny, like it's called a widow's mite, and she cast it. And Jesus stopped the entire service, because he's Jesus, right? He stops the entire service. And he says, everybody, listen up. Hey, everybody, pay attention. Put your phones down. Listen to me. <laughs> Get off Facebook for a minute. Get off Instagram. He said, listen to me. This, this lady right here, this widow, she gave more than all of you. Tells them that. This lady gave more than all of you because she gave all she had. How else could he make that statement unless he knew what every person gave and he knew what every person had? And what he was looking at, even though it was probably the smallest amount, what he was looking at was her sacrifice. And the reason he stopped the service and said, from this day on, wherever the gospel is preached, this story of her will be told as a memorial to her faith. And here I am 2,000 years later, still fulfilling the word of God as a memorial. What are you saying? I'm saying this woman's faith outlived her. Her sacrifice outlived her. 
or sacrifice to God, even though it was a small amount, it was a big sacrifice. That's, this is where, when we come in and offerings, this is where God is not looking at the amount. God is looking at the heart. I tell people, if, you, if, you don't, if you're not tithing, just start tithing. Don't, don't even worry about this. But these are people who are saying, I want to make a sacrifice. This story is amazing because Abraham, the Bible says that Abraham put the wood for the sacrifice on Isaac. But then Abraham, I never saw this till I, I, I read this again, but Abraham took with him the fire and a knife. And you just, you don't, in your mind, when you just read it, you're like, oh, they got to the top of the mountain and they were gonna set a fire. But that's not what it says. It says that Isaac carried the wood, Abraham carried the knife and the fire. That he took with him fire. That he set fire before they left for the journey. He put the wood on the boy and then he took with him fire. Have you ever tried to transfer fire? Have you ever had a candle you're trying to light and you light the stove and you get a little piece of paper and you run over to it and it's out before you, I'm the only one in here that's done that, I guess, but you're like, it's, he carried fire for three days. He took the fire with him. He tended to this fire for three days. What are you saying, pastor? I'm saying some of y'all come in here and you expect us to set you on fire. Instead of you bringing fire with you when you come to church. Maybe some of y'all could bring some fire. Yeah, you, I'm talking to y'all that look at me like a wet piece of wood and it's rainy and soggy and bless me if you can. And y'all up here wearing the worship team out. They sweating. We up here trying to get y'all going and dry you out. <laughs> trying to set you on fire. Maybe you could bring some fire with you when you come up in here. Maybe you could enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his courts with praise. Maybe you could be thankful. And bless his name, for the Lord is good. Come on, somebody, for the Lord. The Lord is good. Is that bless me if you can? Spirit is why God can't bless you. Coming here looking more depressed, sour face, upset, discouraged, worried. Burn out. You burn out because you ain't got no fire. You got to keep the, how do you keep the fire going? You keep reflecting on the goodness of God. You keep reflecting on the goodness of God, the blessings of God, the thankfulness of God. You keep blowing on it. You keep rejoicing. You keep worshiping throughout the week. You put worship music in your car. You put worship music in your house. You, you do devotions throughout the day. You pray throughout the week. You read the Bible throughout the week. You praise, you worship, you give, you sacrifice. You think about the goodness of God. You bring up God at dinner. You bring up God at lunch. You bring up God at breakfast. You, 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 you enter into his gates with thanksgiving, his courts. You pray with the kids. You're praying with the staff, the, the spouse. You're going on prayer walk. You're fasting. You're interceding. You're getting on the phone. I believe God's going to heal you. I believe God's going to make a way for you. I'm not giving up on you. I, I still believe. As long as there's breath in your body, I still believe. I come against the cancer in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus over your body. And, you, and that's how you keep the fire alive. He kept it alive for three days. And they got to the top of the mountain. And they began to stretch him out, lay out the wood. He brought the fire. Abraham brought the fire. The dad brought the fire. This is something that, that men, you have to keep the fire burning. You have to take some personal responsibility to keep the fire burning in your home. To keep the fire of God in your life. To keep the fire burning bright in your life. 
He also took a knife because there is some things that are alive in all of our lives that we need to kill. That there are some things in your life that you have to just say, this has got to die. This has got to die. This, I'm done with this. I'm not worshiping this anymore. I'm not serving this anymore. I'm not carrying this into 2023. God has set me free from this. He delivered me from it. I'm not fighting with it no more. I, I, I'm through. They, th th this, this generational demon of alcoholism, of pornography, of adultery, all, it ran in my family until it ran into me. And I am done fighting this battle, and I'm giving this battle to God. I'm not going to fight it. Hell will not see my children. And you make a decision to sacrifice it. Some of you today have something in your life you need to give to God. God is sick of your songs. He wants your sacrifice. God doesn't need to hear you sing another song. He needs to see your sacrifice. Some of you need to take the thing that you know God wants you to kill and you need to sacrifice it and say, God, this is what you're worth to me. You are worth this to me. I'm through falling asleep to pornography. I want to fall asleep speaking in tongues. I'm through waking up with nightmares. I'm ready to start waking up with vision. And you begin to trust God. And you just say, I'm ready to sacrifice. I'm ready to put things in order in my life. I'm ready to carry the fire. I'm ready to carry the knife. And I believe that everything that God wants me to be, he's placed inside of me. That I don't need another person. I don't need another friend. I don't need another opportunity more than I need you in my life because until you realize that you'll be running after people you'll be running after things and be running after fame and be running after to be known and running after followers and what you need to do is run after him seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you Everything you need to do what God has called you to do is already in you. I wish I had somebody who believed that. I wish I had somebody who believed it. But your destiny, hear me, young people, hear me. Your destiny is moving towards you at the speed of your obedience. Whatever speed you're willing to obey is the speed your destiny is moving towards you. In any area of life, in, any, in every facet of life, the destiny that God has for your life is moving towards you at the speed of your obedience. The vision and everything we want to do is moving towards our church at the speed of our obedience. See, Pastor Joanne and I get the privilege of sharing the vision, but the church decides the pace at which that vision becomes a reality. We don't decide the pace of the vision. They decide because the vision is moving towards our church at the speed of our obedience. And that's why some of you are frustrated because you're not walking in obedience. Some of you are frustrated because you will not carry the fire. You, you live a life where you believe God, but you trust in yourself. You believe in God, but you trust in you. Your money says you trust in God, but your life says you trust in yourself. On the back of every dollar, it says, in God, we trust. 
Yeah, I believe in God, but I trust in me. I trust in my work ethic. I trust in my abilities. I trust in my connections. I trust in my management. I trust in me. I trust in me. I trust in me. You're going to have to learn to trust in God. And that's why you're frustrated because you say you believe in God, but there's no change in your life because you're not bringing the fire. Fire transforms things. You can't even drive your car without fire. You can't start a car without fire. You, you can't. Fire is what takes cake batter and turns it into a cake is because you put it in the fire. Fire transforms everything, and you're wanting change in your life, but you don't let the fire of God transform you. Am I helping anybody in here today? I don't, I don't, I don't want to bore you. Because if y'all hungry, I'm ready to go get something to eat too. But, but you've got to allow the fire of God to transform your life. You've got to let the fire of God transform your marriage. You've got to trust God with your marriage. You've got to trust God with your business. You've got to trust God. As a business owner, I know what it's like. I've got to trust God with my business. I have to trust God with my children. Because sometimes your kids are going to walk through things that you don't. You cannot protect your children from their testimony. My God. You, 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 I can't say everything I'm thinking of. You're going to have to, you're going to have to start trusting the Lord. You're going to have to move from believing in God to trusting in God. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all that ways, acknowledge him that he may direct your path. I wish I could, I feel like throwing my shoe out in the crowd. <laughs> Everything you need to do what God has called you to do is in you. Come, come play some soft for me. Let, me. let me see if I can make this more plain. Um, okay, it's like I, I lost my keys. Anybody ever lost their keys? Come on, I'm the only one in here. Anybody ever, everybody, anybody ever played a key game? It's where you hide the keys from yourself and then you try and find them. I was playing a key game and I had played it for about two days. I was playing this key game and I had gotten sick of losing. And I said, I'm sick of this. I told, I told Pastor Jason, you got to help me find these keys. Because women can find stuff. Guys can't find stuff. You know? Let all the ladies say amen. Y'all got an anointing to find stuff. I told, I told my team, I said, if I'm ever missing, don't send no guy to find me. Just release the women to find me. Because the guy opened the door and look, he ain't there. I look, I look everywhere. And, and so I... I couldn't find these keys. I said, I said, you got to help me find these keys. We went through the house. We was looking, tearing up everything, tearing up the drawers, tearing up everything, looking through clothes, tearing everything, all the pieces, trying to find these keys because I've realized what the key cost. And I said, the devil is a liar. We ain't buying no other key. We got to find this key. And the car's sitting out there, and I said, we got to find this key. And so, and so we was looking, looking, looking. She said, have you looked in the car? I said, I ain't looking in the car. She said, you got me in this whole house, tearing this house up, and you ain't looking in the car. She said, let's go to the car. So we go to the car. We start looking in the cup holders. We start looking. We couldn't find the key. She says, she says start, start the car. I said, I ain't got the key. She said, start the car. Because the key is not a key like you put the key in the ignition like the old ones. It's you hit a button. And so, and so I hit the button, and the car start. She said to me, she said, the fact that the car starts is an indication and proof that the key is in the car. <laughs> and and we, end up, we end up finding the key. 
And what ha- what, when, I, when I found the key, some, something happened to me because we were dealing with this ultrasound bus. And let me tell you something, dealing with this ultrasound bus has been a fight because you don't save babies and not have a fight. And it has been like, all right, you do this, and then that changes. And then you go over here, and that, that's different. And then we go over here to try to do this, and that's different. It's like, you know how you stand in line for something, and you get in, you're in line for an hour, and then you get to the place, and they say you're in the wrong line. And then you go stand in the next line, and you're waiting and waiting and waiting. You get up here, and they say you're in the wrong line. That's what it had been like. And I said, now, God, and I began to think, well, maybe I, maybe I heard wrong, or maybe this, or maybe that. And when she said, when she told me, God, I feel the Holy Ghost. When she told me, she said, the fact that the car started is an indication that the key is in the car. When I looked up and I saw the pictures of those babies that we had saved without having the bus, the Lord spoke to me and said, the very fact that you are already saving babies is an indication that the key is already in the car. Somebody say amen if you know what I'm talking about. I came today to tell somebody, you may not have all the money, you may not have all the staff, you may not have all the plan, you may not have all the personnel, but if there is fruit of any area of the vision in your life, that is a sign that the key is already in the car for you to do the thing that God has called you to do and to accomplish. Keys in the car. You've been looking in the house, you've been tearing up the house, you're tearing up the drawers, you're getting into fights, the key's in the car. You got what you need. Faith has to mix with the word. You gotta let it mix with it. You gotta mix it, you gotta mix it. You gotta mix it. I know it's a food analogy, but, but you, it's, a, it's a cake. You got to mix it. You remember, you remember, you're, come on. It's, anybody know about old mixing where you get the spoon? My mama, my, grand, my grandmama, she had the spoon before you had the KitchenAid mixture. She'd get that batter and she'd get a big old bowl and she'd put it in her arm right here and tuck it. And she'd get that spoon and she's, she's going to mix it in the arm be going like all the time. Mix it, mix it in the arm be. And, and all of that. And come on, y'all, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an arm when you wave high up here, waves by down here. Anybody know about them, them arms? And she'd be mixing it. And that, that's what I'm saying. You got to mix faith. You got to mix it. You, like you mixing the cake. The Bible, the prophet said, the prophet said, one, one, one prophet said, about a man, he said that this man is a cake not turned. Meaning like, you ever, you ever go to bake something and on the outside it looked done and on the inside you cut it and it's all gooey and liquidy. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? It's all gooey and on the outside it looked, it looked done, but on the inside it wasn't. See, when we get ready to pledge here in a moment, The verbiage in the kingdom, kingdom verbiage, is not thank you. Jesus never told anybody thank you. Kingdom verbiage is well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. When we go out to dinner, my wife says she wants her steak. Well done. I want the inside to look like the outside. I think it's awful like that, but that's how she likes it. (laughs) She wants it. She wants it well done. I want. I want what's on the inside to look like what's on the outside. That's what God says you're going to have to be like to get into heaven. You're going to have to be, who you are on the inside is going to have to match who you are on the. And in order 
in order. Because some of us look real good on the outside. But when man looks at the outward appearance, God looks. God, God looks at, at the heart. And some of us sing real good, but we don't sacrifice. Because sacrifice deals with the heart. But, but before we walk into heaven, we're going to have to hear, well done. Meaning, the outside of you matches the inside of you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because servants know how to sacrifice. This is a life of sacrifice. The life of a believer is one of sacrifice. If you don't want to live a life of sacrifice, you ain't going to make it. That's, that's what being a believer is, is a life of sacrifice. Being a Christian is a life of sacrifice. It's not a life of just bless me, bless me, give me, give me. It's a life of sacrifice. And it is, it is monetary, but it's so much more than that. It's with our time, it's with our words, it's with our talents, with our treasure. That while you are writing gifts for your, making gifts for your children and buying gifts for your children... The greatest gift you could give your kids on Christmas is a word from God from you. My son Nicholas wrecked us last Christmas. Last Christmas, we got, we got into giving Christmas gifts. And we don't just do a free-for-all. We kind of go around the, and everybody kind of opens the gift. It takes forever with eight kids. We, there. we have to do intermission, come back. But that's how we do it. We start by reading a Christmas story. Everybody wears red. We're all, it's a whole thing. And my son Nicholas wrecked our family last year because he wanted, to, he wanted to give his gifts. And every gift he gave somebody, he had a prophetic word with it. And so he starts, he starts prophesying over me. He, start, he gave me a gift, started prophesying over me. He gave my wife a gift, start prophesying over her. He gave Penelope a gift, start prophesying over her. He said, Penelope, God's going to heal your eyes. Because you're called to heal. He's, he was 13. He said, because you're called to heal people. He says, your name's Penelope. It has people in it. I can't remember. I cannot remember the gift he gave me. I don't even remember. I'm standing up here. I can't even tell you the gift, but I can tell you the prophecies that he spoke. Nothing shapes your children more than prophecy. Do not be silent this Christmas. You, you are running your own service this Christmas. Do not send your family into 2023 without a prophetic destiny spoken over their life. And today, we're going to pledge something to God. We're going to sacrifice something over the next 12 months, something. How many of you, if God would bless you with something, you would sacrifice it back to him? Come on, can I get an amen about that? If anybody, you get something. Whatever it is. And here's what we're going to do. I'm having my band come to the stage and my worship team. And we're going we're gonna to get your pledge cards. If you haven't got your pledge card, I keep losing my pledge card. This is our sacrifice card. If you don't have one, raise your hand. And our ushers will bring one. So ushers come now and they're going to be passing them out. So any ushers that have pledge cards, bring them. Raise your hand if you want one. And then there's a digital one on the screen. But get a, even if you're a vision builder and you already pledged, get one. And um, so, because what I'm after is, I, I want to, I'm after unity in this moment. I just want to have one moment of unity. It's once a year. Let's just have one moment where we can come together in unity. Isn't that beautiful? Can I get an amen about that? And I'm going to ask us all to do something so, because the service is almost over. And I'm going to ask us all to come in a moment and put in these, these buckets that are up here. And then we're going to pray a blessing to send you out into your day. It's 75 degrees outside. The sun is shining. The birds are. How many of you are ready for our Florida campus one day? Anybody ready for that? I can already tell when we announce that one day, people are like, I know God's speaking to me to do that. I know, child, I know God is in that. Amen. 
If you need a card, just raise your hand. It's early, got plenty of time. You'll be out of here in time to be at Old Country Buffet, first in line. You'll be all right. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Now, now what this is, all our vision builders, they're going to give the best they can towards this vision today. It's a, it's, they, they said over the next year, but whatever they can give today, give. Because the vision doesn't start till the money starts coming in. Can't do anything till that comes in. But this is to say over the next 12 months, if God would bless me with something to do, I would, I would do that. That's what this is. And, um, and I'm not after an amount. I'm after just participation at some level. If you're visiting, I get, you know, you're like, it's my first time here. Um, take the three visit challenge, but we do this once a year. And I make no apologies when it comes to saving babies. Amen. Amen. And, uh, but we're going we're gonna to pray in just a moment. And then all of you in the stands, you're going to come down, put it in. And then you can just stay down here if you want. If you want to bring your stuff when you come that way, because we're going to head out right after service, whatever you want to do. But we're going to do this as an act of faith. And then who's leading us? Our amazing team is leading us here. And um, wouldn't it be better if they came in with fire? How about you guys? Would you guys appreciate it more if they came in with fire? So you know what this is? This represents fire. So you got to bring it. You got to bring it. And I think when we bring the fire, God will do something awesome. You know, you know that story in the Bible where Moses had to lift his hands and as he lifted his hands, the children of Israel won the battle. When his hands began to fall, they started losing the battle and Aaron noticed it and Aaron came over and lifted his hands so they could continue to win. What are you saying? I'm saying sometimes physical obedience produces supernatural miracles. Sometimes we have to do something physically in order for God to do something supernaturally. And that's what coming down to the altar and putting this in that bucket, that's what that represents. It's a physical action that ties to a spiritual moment. So let's all stand all over the house. There you go. Now here's what we're going to do. So Pastor Joanne and I are believing for God to bless um, people in our church. So in order to fulfill the vision that God's given us, it's gonna require millions of dollars. And so God's either gonna to have to bring people in with millions of dollars, or God's gonna to have to raise up people in the church with millions of dollars. That's the only way it's gonna happen. So I'm praying that God would raise up people in our church and bless them with creativity, business strategies, wisdom, insight, knowledge, revelation. How many people want to be a part of that blessing? Anybody? How many people want their business to be blessed? Come on, you're working 40, 50, 60 hours. How many people would love to start their own business? I believe that there's an entrepreneur spirit in our house. And our teenagers have been giving over the last month towards this vision. Can we give them a big God bless you? <clears throat> over the last year, we have seen 4,900 something people come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior in this church. Somebody say amen about that. And over 130 baptized. 131 people baptized. How many people have, have gotten saved? Do they have that? There it is, 4,967 people that hell will not see. So we're believing God for the impossible. I'm believing God for some impossible things in my life, but we serve a God that does the impossible. Almost every Sunday when I walk out here on stage, we prophesy that with you all things are all things are possible. So this is what we're going to do. Everybody lift that pledge to the Lord. Everybody lift their hand to the Lord. Lift it to the Lord. Now repeat this after me. Say, Jesus, I trust you more than I trust me. Today, 
I choose to live a life of sacrifice. If you will bless me, I would gladly bless this vision. I ask for an open heaven over my life and over my family. I prophesy that all of my loved ones will come to know you as Lord and Savior. That hell will see no one in my family. I declare a year of healing over my body and over my family. I speak wisdom, creativity, courage, revelation, and knowledge over my life and over my destiny. I take authority over fear and I speak faith. I prophesy the debt to be paid. I prophesy babies to be saved. I prophesy truth into the city of Andover and that all the vision would be fulfilled by your spirit in Jesus name. Hey, if this sermon blessed you and your family, I want to encourage you to be a truth partner. You can do that by simply going to creativechurch.com slash give and partnering with us to help get this message of truth out to more people in our nation and around the world. It is our truth partners that make this a reality. Again, thank you for subscribing to our channel. Thank you for liking today's video. We'll see you back here on the channel real soon.